in terms of location accuracy. So we're talking about uh, the location has to be within a few centimeters. Wow, that's that's something new, right? So um, here there is an opportunity. Um, actually, I went to um, Universal Burn in August, uh, in October, and I realized that they are the world experts in uh, GNSS software determining they can tell you precisely the uh, location of the satellite within a few centimeters at any given time. Okay, so that's that's something we do not have that capability here. That's why we're trying to learn. And uh, so I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Arnold is here and uh, for the AGU. And uh, so we take take this opportunity, invite him to uh, give a seminar here on how this works. Okay, and that's magic. That's really magic. You know, a few centimeters. That's that's uh, for most of us is like a like ATMS is what the footprint is like a what what what's a footprint tiger? Uh, twenty kilometers. All right. So twenty kilometers are compared to twenty centimeters or better. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. Okay. So uh, Dr. Arnold is a senior research scientist with the Astronomy Institute Universal Bern. That's in Switzerland. That's actually a capital of Switzerland, right? And uh, so he leads a group that does orbit and gravity determination and uh, supported many projects and the LEO satellite de orbital determination and the lunar gravity field determination. He also uh, is a member of the Quality Assurance Working Group for ESA, and uh, um, he supports the called a Center for Orbit Determination in Europe. Uh, so those, all of those are, are new really to us, but the bottom line is they are the world expert in this field, determining you know, the, the precise location, either it's a satellite or something on the ground, right? So uh, let's welcome Dr. Arnold uh, for this excellent opportunity. Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction, and also from my side, welcome to this today's seminar presentation. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. I'm, I'm very honored to give this seminar presentation today and to tell you a bit about uh, the Bernice GNSS software and its application for the, for the precise orbit determination of low Earth orbiting satellites. And if you wonder, what that figure here on the title slide is, that's the logo of our software that should represent the normal equation matrix because there's a lot of parameter estimation involved in this GNSS data processing. All right, <clears throat> that is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first, I would like to tell you a few things, general things about the Bernice GNSS software, what it is and what its wide range of applications are. And then I will talk about GNSS-based LEO POD. And since I already have now quite a couple of abbreviations, uh, I put the list of, of these abbreviations down here so that you're not already lost now. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know what GNSS is, I don't know how f familiar you are with that. It's Global Navigation Satellite System, for example, GPS. I guess you know what GPS is. Um, and since I don't know how familiar you are with GPS and GPS data processing or GNSS data processing, I will put, put uh, or have put uh, a couple of slides to explain the basics just to know, to make sure that everybody knows uh, what I'm talking about. I will then present some results uh, that will demonstrate that the Bernice GNSS software is actually capable for uh, high quality LEO POD. And I will also talk uh, about some ongoing developments that we currently have and I will wrap up with some summary and conclusion. All right, what is the Bernice GNSS software? It's a high-end software package, uh, which is used for the processing and the analysis of GNSS data for, for quite a wide range of different applications. It is developed since many years and maintained by us, by the Astronomical Institute of the University of Bern, Switzerland. It consists of about 100 individual programs um, 
with uh, many functions and subroutines. About 3,500 input options are available. About 400,000 lines of source code. And all these programs are embedded in a graphical uh, menu system. I just show you here uh, an example of this graphical user interface of Bernice. Although that's not too fancy, it's pretty user friendly because uh, each and every single input option has its online help. And you can check the online help if you're lost. And that's actually pretty helpful in, in doing the, the entire processing. It runs on a, quite a number of different computer systems. And it has a, a comprehensive documentation. I uh, brought these two books all the way from Switzerland. This is the documentation of the Bernese GNSS software. You can have a, a look later if you're interested in. And to have such a big book uh, is actually pretty useful because uh, also for us, because you, you also find there a lot of theoretical background if you want to understand what's going on in the software. And that's actually quite unique in this domain to have such a detailed documentation of the software. Uh, Bernice uh, software, I often abbreviate that by CSW, is used by more than 700 institutions worldwide, uh, again, using uh, different kind of applications. And regarding the applications, I would like to first tell you a couple of words about how we use the Bernice GNSS software every day for our IGS processing. The IGS is the International GNSS Service, and we process the GNSS data uh, in the frame uh, of the Center for Orbit Determination in Europe. We do that by uh, basically every day processing GNSS station, which is gathered from, from more than 250 globally distributed stations, IGS stations, and we process this data actually more than once a day, uh, four times a day, to, to really produce high-quality GNSS products. And what are these products? Uh, first of all, the, the most important thing, or one of the most important things, are the GNSS satellite orbits, which are determined. Um, <clears throat> and we do that very accurately in the meantime. In this plot here, you can see the, the, the weekly RMS values of orbit differences between uh, uh, individual uh, contributions of the IGS. So all the lines here belong to individual analysis centers of the IGS, and the red line is code. That's that's our analysis center um, with respect to a combined solution, because the IGS will combine all the input orbits and other products to, to produce a combined product, which is then provided to the user for scientific applications. And whereas in the 90s, uh, everybody was agreeing on the level of, say, some decimeter, so 10 to 20 centimeter regarding GPS orbits, for example, in the meantime, we're talking about two to three centimeter agreement. So all the different analysis centers, they use their own independent software packages. They have their own process, processing and modeling strategies, but still we end up with orbits which are consistent at the centimeter level, level at, at the, at the, in the meantime. And that is very important to have such high accuracy orbits for if you want to use GNSS for scientific applications. Another product which is regularly computed are the the satellite clock corrections, the, the, the satellites, they have a, an atomic clock on board. That's pretty good clocks, but still they are not perfect. And they, they do uh, many fluctuations. And you actually have to know what is exactly the, the clock offset at the current epoch if you want to do precise positioning. So that's also a very important outcome. Then we estimate in this process the Earth rotation parameters, so the location of the Earth rotation axis on the Earth's surface as well as the speed of rotation of the Earth. And besides being very interesting on, on their own, these time series contain a lot of science. You, you see tidal signal in there and stuff. Uh, these parameters are very important to transform between Earth fixed and inertial reference frame. And that is, of course, a very crucial uh, step in the whole, in the whole processing. Uh, then we estimate the station coordinates of all the IGS stations. From that, you can deduce plate tectonic motion. You can deduce seismic deformations, uh, tidal loadings, and so on. We uh, also estimate or extract information about the atmosphere because the signal between the satellite and the ground receivers travel through the atmosphere. We can extract uh, atmospheric information, like, for example, these two hourly resolved global max maps of total electron content in the ionosphere which are produced by us uh, by analyzing this GNSS data. 
all of that is done by the Bernice GNSS software every day at our institute. There are many more parameters estimated, many more products generated. They are all delivered to the IGS. And if you want to download these products for free, actually, it's a, it's a best effort basis, you can visit our FTP server, for example, if you're interested in the coded products, or you can go to the IGS webpage to download the, the combined products. Um, when having LEO POD, the precise uh, orbit determination of low orbiting satellites in mind, then this is a positioning task. And for a positioning task, we are mainly interested in the, uh, the first three bullets here. These are the products which serve as input for the, for the positioning. And now we can basically change our point of view from the producer side to the user side. And of course, we are also, the, we are also user. We are using our own products to do science. Um, the first application, if you have such high precision GNSS position uh, products at hand, is, is of course, uh, that you can have centimeter or even sub-centimeter positioning uh, of ground receivers. And if you can do that, you can do many, many things with GNSS. I guess I don't have to tell you all the applications, geodynamics, reference frame realizations, monitoring, surveying, navigation, things like that. That's enabled by such high-precision GNSS uh, products. Um, you can also do atmospheric research, many, many more applications. I don't want to list them all. I just want to come to the point of precise orbit determination of low Earth orbiting satellites. That's uh, the application I would like to talk today about. And just a reminder, when I uh, say LEO, I actually mean two things. First of all, I mean low Earth orbit, which is an orbit which is by definition uh, at an altitude between, say, 200 and 2,000 kilometers. And at the, at the same time, it's uh, uh, something which is, uh, well, it's a, a low Earth orbiter. So it's a satellite orbiting in a, in a low Earth orbit, just not to be confusing. Um, OK, LEOs, or GNSS-based LEO POD. We have actually quite a lot of LEOs flying in space. And these three LEOs I show here are, or were, very important for us because we were heavily involved in the processing of, of, of data of these LEOs. These are all gravity field missions. So they were dedicated to measuring the Earth gravity field from space, for a global gravity field measurement. And uh, because gravity field estimation is also one of our business, uh, these LEOs are of particular interest for us. And I would like to just mention that we were responsible for the generation of the official GOCHE precise science orbits. And we were doing that, of course, by using our Bernice GNSS software. Uh, there are many more LEOs flying around where we also have hands-on, uh, which are interesting for us. In the later, I will show you some results for Sentinel-3. That's an ESA Copernicus altimetry satellite. And uh, some of these LEOs might also be familiar to you, especially the cosmic satellites. You have probably you know what that is. All these LEOs, they have GNSS receivers on board. Most of them, they have just a GPS receiver. Uh, Cosmic 2 will have a GLONASS receiver as well, so that will also track the, the Russian counterpart of GPS, GLONASS, and will make use of that data for the POD. And the idea is now that you have such a, a GPS antenna, or usually it's several GPS antennas on board of these LEOs, and they track the signal from the high-flying GPS or GNSS satellites and use this tracking data for the determination of the low uh, orbit. And as it will, we will discuss in a few minutes, it's also not only sufficient to have GPS antennas usually, but you should also better know the attitude of the satellite if you want to do really precise orbit determination. Because uh, if, the, if the attitude of the satellite changes, that will change the location of the GPS antenna in three-dimensional space. And since you're interested in the position of the center of mass and not in the center of, uh, well, the, the face center of the antenna, you should know the the attitude very accurately and the best thing you can do is that you have a star tracker uh, on board which measures the attitude by, by tracking the stars and this data can also be ingested by the, by the Bernice GNSS software and used for the POD. Uh, <clears throat> GNSS in a nutshell. Uh, don't look too closely to this table. I've just put three GNSS, so GPS, the most famous one I would say, then the Russian GLONASS and the Galileo and all I want to say here is that these, these are satellite constellations 
of a number of satellites that usually orbit the Earth at a rather high altitude, something between 25 to 30,000 kilometers altitude, and they constantly emit radio signals towards the Earth, which can be uh, uh, received by on ground or in space receivers and used for, for navigation. And as an example, I show you here how GPS signals work. Um, we have an atomic clock on board of each GPS satellite that drives some carrier signal, sine, a sine wave, in the L-band frequency. So uh, it's microwave frequency that is emitted. And it's usually it's two frequencies, and your GPS satellites also have more frequencies than, than just two. And on top of this carrier wave uh, signal, there is encoded um, different kind of codes. So we have uh, usually a CA code, a coarse code, or a P code, that's a precise code. And we also have the broadcast or the navigation message in which you find all the, the things you need for navigation. So the satellite orbit position, the satellite clock offset, and things like that. And with this, with this uh, code, you can actually navigate with your cell phone, with your smartphone, uh, to some 10 meter accuracy. That's, that's fair enough. But if you want to do uh, science, scientific applications of GNSS, then this broadcast navigation information is not accurate enough, and that's why we are doing this IGS-related processing to have better information about the GPS orbit. There are two types of, um, of observations that you can usually do, and I quickly want to mention them here so that you know what I'm talking about later. The first measurement that you can do is a so-called pseudo-range or code measurement where you basically measure the time of flight of the signal between satellite and receiver. So the signal leaves the satellite at some emission time TS and is, is received at the receiver at some emission time TR. And if you uh, subtract these, uh, these, these times, you will get the signal propagation time, multiply this with C, with the speed of light, and you will get the measurement, which is called pseudo-range measurement. Now, um, how does the receiver do that? It will receive the, the signal from the satellite and it will make a replication of the signal internally. And because it's, uh, we have this time shift due to signal propagation, the replicated and the incoming signal are slightly shifted. And the receiver tries to shift the replication until correlation is maximum. And then it can find out this time shift, this time difference, and find this, this bracket here. And then we have the measurement. Now we have to be aware that these two time scales are different. The receiver has its own clock and the GPS satellite has its own clock, and these are usually not the same time scale. In order to unify that, we have to introduce a common time scale, which is known as GPS time, and we have these delta T quantities, which are the clock corrections, the receiver clock corrections and the satellite clock correction. And now we can multiply the time difference in this tom common time scale with the speed of light, and we will get, first of all, the geometric distance between the satellite and the receiver, as well as some tropospheric and ionospheric corrections, and many, many more corrections like relativistic corrections, biases, and stuff like that is in there. But that's the basic observation equation that is needed for, for, um, for uh, estimating then the position, because if you then do a precise point positioning, and the LEO POD is usually a precise point positioning style processing, then you say, okay, I know the, re the satellite clock corrections, and I know the satellite positions from some, somewhere, for example, from the IGS or from, from us. And what I don't know are the clock corrections of the receiver and the position of the receiver. So these are the, the, the things I want to estimate using these kind of measurements. That's the observation equation. That kind of measurement will give you decimeter to meter accuracy. That's quite good, and that, that is also, by the way, how your, your smartphone is doing the navigation. It just takes the, the, the satellite information from the broadcast navigation method. If you want to do better, if you want to go towards the centimeter accuracy, or even sub-centimeter accuracy, then you have to deal with the carrier on its own. You, you're not interested in the code anymore. Well, you are interested in the code, but just to remove the code from the, the signal which is incoming, and you just analyze the carrier phase. The phase of a periodic signal is nothing but this periodic quantity here, frequency times some time. Uh, the phase which is leaving the satellite uh, at some 
uh, emission time Ts is, is, is this quantity here. That's propagating down to the receiver, and the receiver again makes a replica of the, of the carrier signal, and the phase of this replica is at the reception time is again is this quantity here. And what it, the receiver then does, it mixes the, these two signals, the incoming and the replicated signal, and it measures basically the difference between the incoming and the replicated phase. That's the so-called beat phase. And if you do the map, you can again relate this difference of the phases with the, the geometric distance between receiver and satellite, the, the atmospheric corrections, many more corrections, and the time corrections. And you can actually do that, uh, you can use that to go for sub-centimeter or centimeter accuracy, but at the price of having now these um, nasty integer numbers here, these so-called ambiguity numbers, because you can always add an integer number to this quantity here. It will, you will end up with the, with the same carrier phase because that's, that's periodic, right? It's a sign. And to, to interpret that, the receiver just doesn't know what is the integer number of wavelengths between receiver and satellite at, at, the, at, when, at the start. So you don't know that. And therefore, you have to estimate this number, these ambiguities, as additional parameters in your processing. That makes the processing a little bit more complicated but if you're able to do that, uh, then you actually reach centimeter accuracy. And that's how we get down to the centimeter. All right, <clears throat> one last thing about GNSS signals. Um, if you're uh, considering a LEO POD, then the signal just passes through the, the ionosphere, not through the troposphere. The troposphere is below the LEO. Um, and the ionosphere actually uh, dispersively affects the microwave signal. That means it's frequency dependent, and uh, actually the frequency dependence is, is written in this formula here. And I just want to point out that this correction, this ionospheric correction, can easily amount to, to several meters or even tens of meters. So you have to deal with the ionosphere somehow if you want to get down to the centimeter precision. And uh, there are two ways. Either you have a good model, which tells you what is the ionospheric correction that you have to expect, or the better way is that you measure at two frequencies at the same time. If you have a dual frequency GNSS receiver, then you can form what we call an ionosphere free linear combination, which will cancel out the largest part of the ionospheric refraction. And you will, you will be left with the, with the so-called higher order ionospheric corrections, but that's usually pretty small and negligible. Um, and all the results that I'm going to show later are based on the processing of this ionosphere-free linear combination. So to, to keep in mind is if you want to really do a, a good POD of a, of a low Earth orbiting satellite, that satellite should carry a double frequency receiver. Otherwise, you will have trouble to, to reach the centimeter level. You will not. Okay, to wrap up, so we have the, the code and phase observation equations for some GNSS satellite F and, and the LEO, and this rho quantity, again, this is the geometric distance between the satellite, the, the GNSS satellite, and the receiver. Actually, this R LEO vector, this is the position of the antenna uh, phase center and not the position of the, the center of mass. These two quantities are related by an antenna offset vector, from the center of mass to the antenna reference point. And um, since we are usually interested in, in this quantity here, uh, because if we are talking about an orbit, then that's the position of the center of mass of the satellite because that point is following a physical trajectory. Okay, so we want to estimate this position. So we have to know this offset vector. And we have to know this offset vector in inertial space because that is where we in do the, the orbit integration. And the, here is now the point where the attitude of the satellite is needed to, to actually co compute this, this offset vector here. And for the uh, orbit, for this, for this vector here, we have different ways of representations. Uh, we have on the one hand what we call a kinematic orbit, and we have on the other hand something which we call a dynamic or a reduced dynamic orbit. And that's the, the, the next things I would like to explain because I'm going to use these terms in the result sections. A kinematic orbit, uh, on the one hand, is nothing but a discrete set of three-dimensional positions of the satellite at every observation epoch. So it's just purely geometric determination of your position using the GNSS data. You don't care about any satellite dynamics of the LEO. It's just uh, like for a ground station, for a rover, 
a kinematic positioning every second or every 10 seconds. Um, you don't know what's happening in between two observation equations, uh, two, two observations, and you don't know about uh, the velocity of the satellite. Of course, you can then later interpolate these positions to do some stuff, but that will not be given by the estimation of the orbit. On the other hand, we have a thing which is called the dynamic orbit, where we say, okay, we know that the satellite trajectory is actually a particular solution of a differential equation, the equation of motion, and it's actually a function of time. And um, if we can solve this equation of motion and, and uh, find this function, then this will provide us with the Leo position and the velocity at any instant of time. And of course, that strongly depends on your force models that you then introduce, for example, the gravity field model for the Earth. And the last thing, um, well, actually, that is, the, that is the, the equation of motion. Just quickly, on the left-hand side, we have the second time derivative of the position. On the right-hand side, we have all the accelerations acting on the satellite, the Kepler term, which is the largest one, plus all the, the perturbations acting on the satellite, gravitational and also non-gravitational. These are three differential equations of second order, and from math, we know that we need six initial conditions to solve them uniquely. And usually, these are the initial position and the initial velocity of the satellite at a given uh, initial epoch t0. And that is, maybe you know that, that is mathematically equivalent to the six uh, initial osculating Keplerian elements of the satellite, the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, the inclination, the right, uh, the, the longitude of, of the right, ascent, uh, right ascension of the, the ascending node, the argument of perigee and the argument of latitude at T0. So these are now the parameters which we estimate in a dynamic orbit representation. So we estimate the initial condition of the satellite at some initial epoch, T0. And we might also estimate these Q parameters which are optional empirical parameters that you might to set up, for example, empirical accelerations that you, you might want to switch on. Okay. And the last representation I want to talk about is the reduced dynamic orbit representation because that is usually what we uh, use when we do uh, a POD, a LEO POD. We are doing a reduced dynamic orbit re representation. The satellite trajectory again follows uh, or obeys uh, an equation of motion, so it's again physically based but the strength of the force models is now reduced to some extent by adding some additional empirical parameters. These are these P parameters that we now add to the list of parameters, and these are called pseudo-stochastic parameters. They are additional empirical parameters that are characterized by some a priori known statistical properties. So that, for example, you, you say, I know what is the expectation value of these parameters, or you constrain the standard deviation of these parameters. And this, this is a, a pretty powerful tool to actually absorb all kinds of modeling deficiencies that you will honestly always have. Your, your models, your force models, are never going to be perfect, so we will always have deficiencies, and this pseudo-stochastic parameters are very powerful to absorb them. That is just a list of uh, empirical and pseudo-stochastic parameters that can be set up in the Bernese software. I don't want to go through the list. Just to mention that these pseudo-stochastic parameters are the two lower bullets, and one of them is uh, so-called pseudo-stochastic pulses or velocity changes. That is that you allow your orbit to change its velocity instantaneously every X minutes, for example, every, every 10 minutes. And of course, you have to you constrain that. You, that. That are only very, very small velocity changes. They are not physical. That's not physics-based, but they are empirical. It's pseudo-stochastic empirical parameters, but they are a very powerful tool to absorb deficiencies. Okay, so, uh, and finally, that shows you the flow diagram of how we usually do a LEO POD using the Bernice uh, software that was used for, uh, for GOCHE satellite uh, POD. That's why, why it's, it's Gocha here, but it's, it's true for basically all the LEOs that we have. We go in with the GPS orbits and clocks and Earth rotation parameters. For Gocha, we had to do the 30-hour uh, processing, but that's, uh, that's up to you. That doesn't matter. And then in a the first step, we use the pseudo-range data, the code data, to find a first a priori orbit. 
of the, of, the, of the LEO. You don't have to know anything about the a priori orbit, so that will, this will be given by the pseudo range. And with the pseudo range, we also do a first receiver clock synchronization to GPS time. And then <coughs> uh, with this a priori orbit, we go into an iterative phase data screening. You have to carefully screen the phase data because there might be nasty things like cycle flips in there which could mess up your solution. So you have to be careful about screening. This is done in an iterative way. And from here on, we are going to use only the phase data. We are not making use, any use of the pseudo range data anymore for the final POD, the reduced dynamic POD, and then at the end, the kinematic POD. This is all, all based on phase data only. Okay? You can in, uh, add the pseudo range data, but we, usually we don't. Okay, so some, finally some results uh, regarding LEO POD. I'm going to present you some results which are related to this LEO. That's uh, Sentinel-3, 3A and 3B. These are the Sentinel uh, satellites, uh, altimetry satellites of ESA's Copernicus Earth Observation Program. Um, they were launched in 2016 and 2018, 3A and 3B. They orbit the Earth at an altitude of about 800 kilometers in a sun-synchronous orbit, uh, and they are equipped with an eight-channel dual-frequency GPS receiver and a star tracker for the attitude. And since it's an altimetry satellite, we have quite strict uh, accuracy re requirements because, um, of course, if you have an, an error in your orbit, this will directly affect your altimetry measurement, so you want to be certain about your orbit. And the orbit accuracy requirement is three centimeters specified and two centimeter targeted in radial direction. So it's pretty ambitious, and, um, but that works, it works out. And we are a member of this Copernicus POD quality working group, and we have to deliver for all the Sentinels, not just Sentinel-3, also the other ones, uh, orbits to, for validation and engine comparison to make sure that these products are actually uh, usable. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I would like to show you here is that if you want to strive for the highest precision POD, then you have to take into account that your GPS antenna, which is mounted on top of the LEO, usually does not make uh, uniform measurements uh, to, all the me to, to all the directions. So depending on the direction in which you look, you might have different range corrections. And that's simply due to electronic interference or multipath and things like that, which will cause your uh, antenna to measure non uh, homogeneously or non-uniformly in, in certain directions. These so-called um, phase center variations, antenna phase center variations, are usually pre-calibrated on ground before launch, but usually these ground calibrated maps, they are not really usable because the, the space environment is simply completely different from the ground environment. And we have to usually do our in-flight calibration of the PCV maps, and we do that by stacking uh, phase residual, carrier phase residuals of a reduced dynamic POD over an extended time span. And this here shows you such a map for the Sentinel-3A uh, GNSS antenna, where you see now these uh, range differences between plus, 20, plus and minus 20 millimeters. So these are actually pretty important systematic effects, which you should take into account if you want to go for the centimeter level. All right, that is showing you the carrier phase residuals the ionosphere-free carrier phase residuals after having done the POD. So the residuals show you how well you could fit the GPS data uh, for both the reduced dynamic and the kinematic orbit. That's actually just one day and it's a, it's a calm day. And there's, there's nothing special about it. You might recognize these little uh, peaks here. That is usually when the, the satellite flies over the polar areas where we have more ionospheric activity due to geomagnetism. And that makes the positioning a bit more, well, more difficult. And there, the residuals usually get a little bit higher. What you can also see, and also from, from this plot here, which shows the daily RMS values of these residuals for the entire lifetime of Sentinel-3 so far, is that the reduced dynamic residuals are usually slightly higher than the kinematic ones. But that's simply due to the fact that for the kinematic orbit, you estimate many, many more parameters. You estimate a position at every epoch where for the reduced dynamic orbit, you just estimate, well, a couple of parameters, just the initial conditions plus some, some um, empirical parameters. 
So that's why the residuals are usually slightly large. But we can say that in average, uh, we are somewhere at the 3.5 millimeter level where we can actually fit the carrier phase data. And you might also notice that we have some sort of a seasonal variation in here. And if you plot uh, the total electron content uh, on top of that, um, so that's the, the total electron content in the ionosphere, which is um, a proxy for the solar activity, and then you will see that these lines are actually correlated whenever uh, the total electron, electron content is a bit higher, also the residuals get higher because the, the ionosphere disturbs the signal propagation and makes the positioning a bit more difficult. However, I have to say that right now in 2016 to 18, the ionosphere is pretty calm because the solar activity is rather low, I guess you know that. Uh, whereas in 2013, 14, it was much, much more active and we had much more trouble sometimes when doing certain POD applications. But even then, it was, it was working. Sure. How, how is this uh, ionosphere correction uh, error, let's say, will affect the POD so that you will affect your, for example, temperature at 30 comets in, I mean, like, uh, what, one? Well, basically, if you, if you use um, double frequency data, then you get rid of the largest part of the ionospheric correction. And um, what you see here are just these remnants, these higher order ionospheric corrections, which are usually really negligible. I, I'm not sure what you, what you were asking about temperature. Um, Everything is depending on the POD, and then POD, you use that. Yes. In the first slide, uh, a few slides, you mentioned you also derive your ionosphere, <coughs> and then troposphere. Yes. How does this actually affect one by one the lower? Mm. Well, I, I cannot give you numbers right now, but I can say that for the POD, for example, in this example, you do not really see a degradation of your position, a significant degradation of your positioning by, by these kind of, of uh, fluctuations of your residuals. It's just, it's just a reflection that, that the positioning gets a little bit more difficult because you have more activity, but it will not really harm your position of the satellite. So is that, um, very clear. So is that fair to say, because uh, in the first few slides you mentioned in the early time that the POD is you know, certain larger, and then Right now, it seems like no matter what center you are using, they are so small. But that was the, the, the GPS orbit. There I was talking about the GPS orbit, this, this plot that you, that you probably have in mind, whereas this is the, the orbits of the LEOs now. And that's, that's, that's something else. So, yeah. All right. Um, we are usually always, when doing a LEO POD, we are always computing both a reduced dynamic and the kinematic orbit at the same time. And it's always a good idea to actually compare these two orbits uh, because they are, well, not completely independent, but they are pretty different types of orbit. One is just pure geometry and the other one also involves pretty much dynamics. Uh, and this is actually a comparison of these uh, two orbit types in radial, tangential, and normal direction. That is a common satellite frame which is useful for such comparison and which is attached to the satellite. So first axis is simply the radial direction from Earth to satellite. Second axis is along the velocity of the satellite. And the third axis would be perpendicular to the, to the orbital plane. And um, you can see that uh, these two types of orbits in this case here agree, well, again, on some centimeter level. We, we have several things that we can see here. For example, the radial component is the noisiest one. We have more noise there, but that's simply because the radial component is the most correlated one with the receiver clock. So it's more difficult to estimate the, the radial component. It's exactly the same as for ground receivers where the height coordinate is always the most difficult coordinate to estimate because of correlations with clocks. Then we have this once per revolution uh, structures in here, which are can be related to the reduced dynamic orbit and to deficiencies of, uh, uh, of your models, gravity field models, but also to the, to the float ambiguities, as I will show you later. And the normal component usually is the, the smoothest one. It's pretty flat here. And checking these kind of orbit differences is always a good idea because you can uncover or you can cover uh, 
some problems that you have. If you have a problem in sensor offset, you have to know, remember, you have to know the, the vector from the center of mass to the, to the antenna. And believe it or not, but it's, it's always a mess to get accurate information about this vector. It's, it's, I mean, sounds easy, but it's not. And you can easily make errors and mistakes. And if you have a wrong offset, that wrong offset will turn or influence differently the kinematic orbit than the reduced dynamic orbit. The kinematic orbit will freely shift around by a wrong offset, whereas the reduced dynamic orbit will be restricted by some dynamics. And then you have a chance to see that in these um, orbit differences. Uh, just to, for, for uh, completing the story, here is the daily RMS values of three-dimensional orbit differences for the entire time span of, of Sentinel-3A. We, we see that they agree, agree somewhere on the, on the two centimeter level. However, um, I mean, it's useful to do that, but you should be aware that this is simply an internal uh, orbit consistency check. So in principle, both orbits could still be wrong and you wouldn't notice so much or so directly in, in these kind of comparisons. To have really an independent validation of your orbit is actually not that easy. But one way how you can do that is um, satellite laser ranging. That is the Timmerwald uh, satellite laser ranging station that's uh, close to Bern, that is our observatory, where we do optical astronomy, but also satellite laser ranging. We shoot a green laser to, to satellites and uh, do that, uh, use these measurements to, to actually uh, do SLR validation of satellites and also um, many, many other applications. The, the idea is that you have satellites which need to be, of course, equipped with some retro reflector. That is an example of such a retro reflector that has to be mounted on the satellite. And the principle is then that you shoot a laser pulse to the satellite um, that is reflected towards the station again, is received, and from, from the time between emission and reflect, uh, reception, you can actually compute the range between the station and the satellite at a given instant. Of course, up to, to many corrections, again, atmosphere, relativity, and stuff like that, but you can do it. And the SLR validation is now working as follows. You take the orbit that you have computed, and you, 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 you compute a predicted range from the orbit solution. And you compare that range between satellite and station. You compare that with the measured range by the SLR measurement. And the difference between the computed and the, uh, the measured range, this is what we call an SLR residual. And you can actually take these SLR residuals for an independent, that's a completely independent validation of your satellite orbit. And the SLR validation, by the way, is also possible with the Bernice software. So you can ingest also the SLR data and will uh, provide you with the SLR validation. So this plot here shows you the SLR residuals for the orbit solutions I have been showing to you in a couple of previous slides for Sentinel-3A for the entire lifetime. In the beginning, we did not have any kind of SLR observations, but then uh, after a few weeks, uh, SLR observations started. Each and every single point here is an SLR residual. So it's a difference between the computed and the observed range. And we are here within, well, plus minus 20 centimeters. Most of them are located much closer towards zero. Well, you see here the statistics for the reduced dynamic orbit. We have a standard deviation of 1.3 centimeters. And for the kinematic orbit, that's normal. We always have uh, a little bit more noise. We have 1.8 centimeters. That's just how the kinematic orbit behaves because it's much less restricted by dynamics. It's, it's more data driven. Okay. Uh, so that is somehow a proof uh, of, of, of the quality of your, of your orbit, an independent proof. What is not so nice here uh, is that we have actually a non-zero bias, a non-zero offset, five millimeters. Well, you would say that's probably not so much, but uh, for an altimetry mission, you, you start to care about millimeters, actually. Uh, but the reason for that is that these solutions were, were computed without applying any non-gravitational force modeling. So we were, they were pretty reduced dynamic orbits. We set up a lot of empirical parameters. And then if you have problems with your sensor offset, and we most likely still have problems with sensor offset in Sentinel-3, uh, then that can shift around your, your orbit. And that's, that's probably, most probably the reason for this, for this offset that we see here. All right, that already brings me to the, to the last part where I would like to talk uh, a bit about the ongoing developments. 
two examples I'm going to show. Um, the keyword I've already mentioned is uh, non-gravitational force modeling. Uh, the Bernice software version 5.2, so the one which you can actually currently buy, does not include any non-gravitational force modeling, so air drag, solar radiation pressure, earth radiation pressure modeling for the LEOs at all. However, um, well, the reason for that is that the pseudo-stochastic parameters, they are very, very powerful, and we can actually produce very high-quality LEOs about even caring about, um, uh, without even caring about these complicated models to do non-gravitational force modeling. But of course, if you then go for altimetry missions, it might be, you might be interested in having much more uh, strict radial leveling of your orbit solutions, and there, this is the place where you start to be interested in non-gravitational force modeling. We have implemented in our development version of Bernice software uh, these non-gravitational force, model, uh, these, these force models, uh, you can see here some representative numbers which are valid for Sentinel-3. So these are nanometers per second square. Sounds like small accelerations, but they, uh, well, they affect your orbit significantly. Um, and of course, you then start, you need to, to describe your satellite with a macro model. And this plot here uh, is an interagency, shows an interagency comparison of our modeled non-gravitational accelerations with other agencies that do LEO POD with their own software packages. And we can see that we all, most, most of them agree pretty well, at least here for the solar radiation pressure, when it goes to the air drag or um, earth radiation pressure, the differences are a bit higher because these models are more complicated and there are more modeling differences that we can have. But also there, we agree on a pretty sophisticated level, I would say. And I would also like to mention that for this Copernicus uh, service, we also uh, deliver uh, orbits for Sentinel-3, which are based on non-gravitational force modeling. And this plot here shows you a comparison of a combined solution with the individual, uh, individual uh, contributions. And the magenta line here, this is our non-gravitational based solution that actually performs pretty well compared to the, to the other contributions. So we are doing a good job here in, in, also in, in modeling the non-gravitational force forces. Uh, the second um, development I would like to mention here is the single receiver ambiguity fixing. So you remember these ambiguity parameters, this integer number of, ambi uh, of, of wavelengths between receiver and satellite. Uh, these ambiguity parameters are estimated like any other parameter as float values. But in theory, we know that they should be integer values, right? And actually fixing them to their integer values this is the so-called ambiguity fixing or ambiguity resolution. This is known to stabilize your solution quite significantly. However, uh, if we have nasty things like satellite and receiver biases, because we have them, this will render the ambiguities non-integer, and it's becoming hard to actually resolve them to their integer values. And the classical approach would be that you have a differential GNSS processing, where you just don't have one receiver, but you have, for example, two receivers, and you form differences of observations between the two receivers, and you also form differences of observations between two GPS satellites. These are so-called double difference observations. They will cancel out all these nasty phase biases, and you can then actually do the integer ambiguity resolution. If you want to do just a single receiver ambiguity fixing, you have to come up with somebody who delivers you these uh, phase biases, receiver and, well, satellite phase biases. And since July of this year, CODE actually routinely produces a high-quality signal-specific phase bias product, which can be introduced to the Bernice software, and the Bernice software has been extended in the meantime to actually allow for single receiver ambiguity fixing. And this, as I've said, this significantly stabilizes the solution. As you can see here, for example, uh, in the reduced dynamic versus kinematic orbit differences in one direction for GRACE A, so that is now a GRACE satellite, you, you probably know about GRACE, uh, whereas for the float solution, that's the red solution we had, you remember we had this once per evolution, periodic uh, deviations, they are, when, when, when fixing the ambiguities, they are basically gone, and we are left more or less with noise here. So that really significantly stabilizes and improves your, your solution. And you can also see that in case of GRACE, we have this ultra-precise K-band intersatellite link, 
So we have a microwave link between grace A and grace B, which allows you to also uh, do an independent validation of your orbit by comparing this with the K-band measurements. And when doing a float, an ambiguity float solution, so the type of solution I was presenting you so far, then we see that we have a KBR residual RMS of somewhere around five to six millimeters in average for this month. When fixing the ambiguities, we go down to one to two millimeters KBR residuals. Also that shows you that fixing ambiguities is really beneficial for your orbit solution. And you can also see it actually in the SLR residuals for grace A and for Sentinel, well, A and B and Sentinel 3A, 3A and 3B, uh, both for a reduced dynamic and the kinematic orbit. On the left-hand side, you have the float solution. On the right-hand side, you have the zero difference ambiguity resolve solution. And just to point out a number, when doing a float solution for grace B, reduced dynamic, we have a residual, SLR residuals of 12.1 millimeters. And with the fixed solution, we go down to, oops, sorry, to 8.5 millimeters. Also, that is quite a significant improvement in terms of SLR residuals. All right, that brings me to my summary and conclusions of the talk. Uh, I hope to have shown you that the Bernice Genesis software is a powerful tool to do many nice things, many applications, especially also uh, Leo POD. We have a wide user community. It's well-tested software because we have this wide user community and also because we use the software every day for our own purposes and it's constantly, constantly improved. Um, BSW is capable of computing high quality reduced dynamic and kinematic Leo orbits, also including providing the SLR validation. And just to mention that it will be used by UCAR for the POD of the upcoming Cosmic 2 satellites. We have a common project with them. and They will use Bernice for the, for the POD. And if you want to have more information on the software, including the PDF of this documentation, you can find it online on this, on this URL. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, the thing is that for every version that we release, we always have new things implemented. Right. So we all, we constantly have we have our development version where we constantly work on and which we constantly improve. And then the logic is that at some day X, we decide okay, this is now the version which we should give to the user, and then we give that to the user and we increase our internal counter version counter and we start uh, we, we go on developing the version. So there will always be improvements. And for yeah. Well, it's it's hard to say. I mean, it depends on what you what you do exactly for for the POD. For example, if if in the next version there will be non gravitational force modeling included. Um, you, of course, you might introduce biases if you switch them on, and if you, do, if you use a different parametrization of your orbit, then you, you, you might introduce uh, uh, biases. So that's, that's possible, yes. Well, that, I mean, I have to say, we did not really do a lot of um, tu fine tuning of this solution. So that, I, I guess we could still fine tune the solution, maybe constrain some empirical or pseudo stochastic parameters a bit more to, to, to make this bias smaller. And actually, we should probably do it. But since we are also delivering this non gravitational uh, based orbits now to, to Copernicus. We, we do not really care too much about it. Actually, Copernicus wants us to deliver, to, to keep on delivering this uh, classic reduced dynamic orbit because this is exactly how you can observe, how you can detect 
uh, that you have problems in sensor offsets. Because if you have a, like a, a purely dynamic orbit, you will not notice that in terms of biases. Because uh, if you have a wrong offset, then your orbit will just not care. It will maybe, well, just a bit, little bit, your residuals will get larger, but it will not be shifting around. And of course, that's not good. But if it's shifting around, you will see it in the SLR residuals. And you will realize, oh, man, we have a problem with antenna offsets. That's, that's how you can detect these kind of problems, actually. Yes. Argos. Well, we, 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 don't need, we don't need any um, a priori information because we, as I said, we, we, we do that with the pseudo range observations. So the logic is that we, we first do a, a kinematic orbit determination using the code observations. That will be just like on the meter level accuracy, but that will give you a first orbit. We fit that, these kinematic positions then with some reduced dynamic orbit and that will give you the, the first uh, initial orbit. That is how we get it, by from the pseudo range data. Yeah, let me let me explain that. So I I know what your question was. So the question is how do we use this software to, to get to a centimeter level accuracy? Uh, okay, what well, we actually look at that. So the the bottom line is uh, you need to have the carrier face information from the from the GPS, the carrier face, and which if you don't, then you can't. Okay, uh, dual frequency carrier phase. Yeah, that's that phase information, which is the key to, to this, uh, you know, centimeter level accuracy. If you don't have that phase information, I think that somebody, when we look at that on the JPSS and the carrier phase is not available or something. Right, right. So not not a not a are we. I mean, even if measured, maybe it's not a downlink. So yeah, that's the limitation. Okay, you have? Uh, can I can confirm, because you must be about the uh, first model. Uh, you integrate the laser antenna with the uh, uh, mass uh, distribution of the Earth. The change of the mass of distribution of the Earth. Yes, exactly. So if you want to do a reduced dynamic orbit, then you have to introduce the gravity field model of the Earth. And there are, well, pretty advanced models which resolve the, the gravity field in terms of spherical harmonic coefficients usually. They go up to degree in order 200 if you want. And uh, the lower the orbit is, the more crucial this, this detail becomes. So that's the static gravity field, the time arrival gravity field, then you have um, ocean tidal, uh, ocean tides, pole tides, all these, all these kinds of, of uh, gravitational perturbations which you have to take into account, yes. But they're all models in there, and they are somehow standardized also by the IRS conventions. Yeah, Sean. So from your preparation, how much optimization would be needed to calculate? What do you mean by a new instrument? Like a cost maker two or another like a All right, yeah. So in case of Cosmic 2, the thing is that uh, there are two antennas which are connected to one receiver only. Okay, there is not two independent receivers. 
And we are currently in this project with uh, UCAR uh, to improve the software such that you can actually use the two antennas which are connected to one receiver but estimating cable biases because you might have a bias uh, because you have different cable lengths or signal uh, paths in inside. Uh, and also because they are going to use GLONASS, we also have to make different cable biases for, for GPS and for GLONASS because they, are, they have different frequencies. So these kind of things, they of course, they need quite a lot of work and if that's this, why we have this common project. But if you have a standard GPS receiver on board like a blackjack, uh, then you just, you just go for it. That's, you can use it. You don't need to do anything. Then you have a Um, this is actually constant, basically constantly done when doing this uh, Sentinel, this Copernicus comparison, because there are also groups producing uh, Sentinel orbits with Gypsy from, from the Technical University of Delft in, in the Netherlands. They are also using uh, Gypsy for, for the COD, and th the orbits are always compared with uh, all, all, the, all of the orbits are injured compared. And in the case of Sentinel-3, as I've shown here, we agree on a, on a pretty on a pretty good level. At least if the level is lower than, than what is targeted. The phase center time series. Yes. So the idea is that you 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 make a reduced dynamic POD without any phase center correction at all, and then you get residuals, carrier phase residuals, and you start to bin these carrier phase residuals in the antenna diagram. So you you see which is the what is the elevation and azimuth of each individual uh, residual point, and you start to stack them, and this will give you a first a first map of this uh, PCV correction. Then you reintroduce that into a second iteration of Leo, of Leo POD. The residuals will get smaller because you subtract the largest part of the, of the systematics. And you, you repeat that. It's an iterative process because um, uh, you, you need several iterations until it's iterated out. There are better ways, and we are actually, we are also, this is one of the developments we are also thinking about, to estimate uh, instead, just to estimate directly the, the antenna phase center in terms of spherical harmonic parameters. This is possible actually already in Bernice, but it's, I think it was never used for Leo, at least. So, so your orbit uh, position is re released in which coordinate? Is it in the ECEF or initial coordinate? Um, usually when we exchange orbits, this is done in the so-called SP3 format, where you have the Earth fixed coordinates of the, of the satellite. My question is, uh, if you initial to the Earth fixed, Coordinate transformation. You know the different software. When you change the order and check all the software, it gives you you know centimeters. You know the difference. As I understand it, you know that. You just you just have to make sure that everybody is using the same transformation law, including the same Earth rotation parameters. I think if you use the exact same, you know the inputs, how long, also you know all the parameters are the same, from software also from the NOAA software. You know, the orbital transformation also have a centimeters difference. Okay. How do you, you know, deal with that? Yeah. Um, actually, we, we never compared with these different software packages that are used for Sentinel. We never compared how well they, they agree uh, regarding the transformation of, uh, between inertial frame and, and earth fixed frame, frame. But since our orbit solutions, they are agree already on, on the centimeter level, I would say there's at least not a large, a large issue in there. But, um, well, of course, we all know that it's easy to make mistakes there, and maybe it's worth to actually check such a transformation between the software and the session. Uh, your Star Trek, the antenna, you know, on a different position, you need to count, you know, is, uh, this, this position difference. Yeah. Your Star Trek, the antenna attitude, mm -hmm. different set of position. Yes. Okay. the receiver also on the different position. Do you need to count, you know, the altitude? Yes. I'm not sure if I understand the question. So, our track is the side of the position. 
the star tracker will tell you the attitude the, the, yeah. of, of the satellite. Position compared to the, you know, the GPS receiver. That, that, that doesn't matter. I mean, what you need to know is how your satellite fixed reference frame is located in three-dimensional space. And, and once you know that, uh, you don't care where this information is coming from if the star tracker is located at a different position than the GPS antenna. It's just the, the rotation of this three-dimensional coordinate frame in, in space. And once you know that, you also know the offset vector between the center of mass and the GPS antenna. Yeah. But that is, that is something where, where we, we, we do not really do the, the pre-processing of raw star tracker data. We just use them. What, what comes out from, from the pre-processing is quaternion data, so rotation information, which you can just introduce into Bernese as a, as a input data, a level one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, um, I was showing this, um, this total electron content maps in the beginning. So that is a product that is, that is uh, routinely pro um, processed by our center. Every, every two hours we, we, we release these maps. We measure from this global network of ground stations. We also measure the, the total electron. Yes, but using Bernice. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. That is based on, on ground receiver data, exactly, from these 250 globally distributed stations. Yes, yes. No, no. That is really ground based, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, any other questions? This is an excellent seminar. Let's thank Dr. Arnold again. Thank you. Thank you very much.